I know this, the road I'm on right now, this was my decision. I look ahead and I look behind and all I see is broken landscapes littered with my bad choices. The truth is, when it comes to my thoughts and the words I speak and the actions I take, I am my own worst enemy. I cannot win this war on my own. Every mile along the way, every turn that I take, I will need a strength greater than my own. A guide who sees what I cannot. Someone to take the wheel and show me the way that leads to victory. I once heard Jerry Seinfeld say to a crowd of people that were listening to his jokes, he told them, I could talk to all of you, but I couldn't talk to any one of you. And he was saying, you know, talking to a big crowd is fine, but one-on-one -on -one I would struggle. And I remember hearing that just thinking, man, that explains so much of the angst in my life. It's an ironic thing that I get paid literally as my job to talk to groups of people. And I can talk to thousands of people, 80,000 at a time. But some of the most challenging moments of my life have been talking to just one person. I could talk to all of you, but it's hard for me to talk to just any one of you. And it's funny to think about a battle like that happening all the time. And that kind of battle has popped up throughout my whole life. I remember one specific moment, I was at a networking event. I hate networking events. To me, hell is a cocktail party. Uh, but at this crowded kind of bar restaurant area in a hotel lounge, I remember walking in and just feeling so alone, even though I was surrounded by all these different people. The problem was I didn't know anybody. I looked around and all the sea of faces, it just seemed like they were all strange to me. But eventually I, I, I caught the eye of two people that I knew and I was so excited and relieved and I finally felt like, oh my gosh, there's, there's, there's a moment here in this restaurant where I can belong. So I walked up to these two people and to my delight, they were, hey, they recognized me and invited me over to talk to them. And so I began to just talk to them and all of a sudden I felt just all of my tension and anxiety sort of melt away a little bit because where I had walked in and felt like everyone was looking at me and I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb and I didn't belong there and I didn't have my people to be with, that we, we, what we all long for. All of a sudden now, once I was with these two, I had an identity. I was a part of this group. I was a part of this moment and it just changed everything. To my horror, a few minutes into the conversation, someone walked into the room that literally every single person in that whole environment, every single person knew them, knew them well. Every one of you would know this person. He walks into the, 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 the lobby and like I said, everyone stares at him and he made a beeline straight for us. For a minute I was excited, oh my gosh, now I'm about to be in a moment that's even bigger, it's even better and I, I'm included, I belong here. To my dismay, he walked up to the two people I was talking to and asked them if he could borrow them for a moment. Didn't say a word to me, but asked these two people that were my security blanket. They were my passport into belonging and into feeling good and feeling accepted and into feeling validated. And he took these two people and he grabbed them by the elbow and he escorted them away from me. And I'm left standing right there completely by myself again, only now it wasn't my imagination. Everyone in the room was looking at me as I'm now the guy who didn't go off in this other conversation. And it was like all my middle school anxiety, all my fears about belonging and being accepted, all these insecurities bubbled up as I stood there literally feeling like I was just rejected and second class and I hadn't been picked for the team and I wasn't at the cool kids table. 
And it was so hard because as I walked away, I was just dealing with all of this red faced emotion and I hated how much I cared about how that felt. I don't know on what terms you can relate to that, but I know this, the struggle is most definitely real. Maybe you effortlessly interact with other people and so that's not your particular war of choice, but maybe it's overeating or perhaps it's compulsive spending or you pull your phone out to check it mindlessly without even paying attention to what you're doing. I know this, all of us have a war we are fighting and it's a war we're facing within. The truth is that when it comes to the thoughts that we think, the words that we speak and the actions that we take, the decisions that fill our days up, we are all in a battle. Jesus said in John chapter 10 that he's the door and that we can go in and out through him and experience life. But he also said that the devil, the thief, has come to steal and to kill and destroy. That's John 10, 10. Jesus is the door that we can come into and out of and find life. But the devil wants us to go through a door that will lead to us being stolen from, and killed and ultimately destroyed. You see, God and the enemy both have an agenda for your life. Jesus wants to bring you into a broad place. He wants you to experience not just life, but life to the full. That word can be translated from John 10:10. 10, 10, that's to the full. It can be translated as super abundantly. So think of the greatest life imaginable. And it's better than that because it's not just biological life. It's actually abundant, eternal life. It's transcendent. Now here's the kicker. Our thoughts, our words, our actions, every day repeated, things that we choose to allow into our minds, how we choose to speak. In these sessions, what we're gonna be talking about is the way that every choice we make in speaking, in thinking, in feeling, and in responding in life, it's a door that we're choosing to walk through. And we have to pick our doors carefully because where the doorway spits you out on is now the place where you're going to be standing and the life that you're going to be living. And this is the war. It's choosing the right doors. It's making the right decisions. It's allowing the places that we go and the things that we think and the realities that we allow to be framed in our perspectives to be ones that are going to lead to life and not lead to death. The easiest thing in the world to do is just to react to life, to just do whatever you feel, to see a door, go through the door without first asking the question, where is this door going to lead? And is it somewhere I want to be? Remember, your good shepherd, Jesus, he always leads to life, but the enemy is trying to take you to a place where your life lies in desolation and in ruins and where you're just surrounded by regret, where you've ended up at a place where you, you don't want to be. Our hearts and our lives and our futures and our relationships can either be nourishing and replenishing and life-giving, saturated with life, a place you'll want to be, an environment you'll want to be in, or they can be selfish and racked by bad decisions. And the truth is that Jesus has more for your future than you could even imagine if he were to tell you today. But we have to day by day choose to allow him to lead us as the good shepherd through the right doorways, regardless of how we're feeling in the moment, for us to be able to arrive at the place where he wants us to go.
So we know that some doors are going to take us to life and some doors are going to take us to decisions that are going to lead to death. That's all and well. Jesus has life for us, life to the full. The devil, the thief, he wants to rob us, to kill us, and to destroy us. For us to look around the deserted ruins of our lives and our families and our futures that are meant to be rich. There should be kids playing and family eating a meal. There should be a legacy of righteousness. Instead, the enemy wants us to look at the ruins and to, to see the ashes, to see only what could have been to see remnants and traces of what should be full and fun and, and final. So we figure out, okay, so there's doors that lead to life, doors that lead to death, got it. But how do I quit going through the wrong doors? Because I don't know about you, but I know that there are decisions that when I take them, when I make them, when I say those things, when I think those things, every time it leads me to death. Every time I do that, that's how I feel. I eat when I'm feeling emotional, but I don't feel happy afterwards. It's not like those carbs actually fill me up in a good way. I know every time I go to comfort food, it doesn't actually comfort me. So it's one thing to know, okay, that's a door that leads to death, and yet I keep going through those doors. And we end up like Paul who said in Romans 7, I know what I want to do, and that's not what I do. And I know what I don't want to do, and that's what I keep doing. So, so how do we figure out how to actually make the right decisions? How do we day in and day out do those things? Because isn't it so frustrating to keep going through doors that you said you weren't going to go through anymore? Isn't it so aggravating and irritating that every time you have a few minutes, you don't even think about it. You just grab your phone and you're mindlessly once again getting the dopamine hits that come from being on social media. And whatever it is for you, I know this, we can't change a problem we don't know about. And so that then brings up the question, how do we get out of our own way? How do we stop creating problems for ourselves? How do you stop making your life more difficult than it needs to be? Well, the answer is for me, I've decided to declare war. I've decided to choose to literally say, I declare war on my tendency to sabotage myself. And I invite you to join me. There's power in saying it. There's power in the words, I declare war. When, when I say that, it reminds me of that card game. Maybe you played it at your grandma's house or with your siblings. Deck of cards is split up between two people and you're putting one at a time down and eventually there comes this like moment where there's a tie and then you have to put down four cards in a row and the goal is to get the whole deck. The goal is to get all the cards on your side. And there's an act of when you put those four cards down of saying out the phrase, I declare war. And I think those four syllables lead to freedom. I declare war. And I want you to join me, not in my war, in your war, in realizing that you have a war on your hands, a war with yourself. We have all sorts of different struggles. I mean, there's man versus nature, man versus machine, there's, there's man versus animals, right? But I think our greatest conflict, I think your greatest conflict is the war against yourself. It's man versus himself. Here's why. There is a devil. We've talked about him. He's the thief. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And there is an issue that we have with the fallen world. The Bible says the world is enmity against the ways that God wants us to walk in. But the real bugger is we have a flesh. We have a fallen nature. And so we are more than possible of creating problems for ourselves, of sabotaging ourselves and tripping ourselves up from the future that we in fact actually want. And you can't win a battle that you won't admit you're in. And that's why a declaration is so important. It's imperative. I mean, where would we be as a nation had there not been that declaration of independence? 
what I'm trying to say is I want you to get your inner John Hancock on. I want you to sign that thing. I want you to stamp that thing and to declare I, I'm go, it's open season on anything in myself that's holding me back from the life that I was born to live. I, I'm telling you, when you make that decision to rise up and to fight the battles and to no longer just accept, well, I'm always going to be short tempered or I'm always going to be narcissistic or, you know, I've just I, for my battle. I've struggled with these insecurities since middle school. So that's just that's just how it is. When you decide to not accept what is, but fight for what should be to fight for what Jesus died for you to experience and to live out. Something happens. Something shifts. It alters the atmosphere and a new you rises up. President Teddy Roosevelt was once a rough rider, and he led a, a group of heroes in the Spanish-American War for the Battle of San Juan Hill on the island of Cuba. And he tells about something that happened on July 1st of 1898, when he crossed a barbed wire fence that was lying on the ground, and he decided to actually go fight this battle. You see, he had all his life talked about battle and thought about battle and thought it would be great to be in a battle, but on this day, he crossed the barbed wire and he entered into a battle for the first time. And he said, describing that day, that a wolf rose up in his heart. A, a wolf has long been a symbol of strength, of power, of loyalty, of intuition. And he said he felt, though he was fearful beforehand, when he crossed that barbed wire and he entered into a place where bullets were flying around his head. He said there was an exhilaration that laid hold of him. And once he had committed himself to this conflict, something brand new broke on the inside in a very good way. For the rest of his life, Teddy Roosevelt, he talked about that day as the greatest day of his entire life. And I'm just telling you that when you choose to declare war, that you're no longer gonna give quarter to things that are holding you back and you instead are going to oppose them, the wolf is going to rise in your heart. So throughout this sessions, we're going to be talking about words and thoughts and actions. Those are the first three cards that we're going to be laying down on the table in our declaration of war. We're going to choose to intentionally figure out the words that we want to speak and the thoughts that we want to think and the actions we want to take that are eventually going to lead into habits. But the most important thing is that we get right the last card because in that card game war, it's one, two, three. But then that fourth card is what determines who wins that engagement. In our declaration of war, we can't just focus on our words and our thoughts and our actions because those are all things that we're doing ourselves. They're important. I would even say they're essential. But unless we get that fourth card right, unless we get that last key, it's all going to be useless because it'll all just be self-help and what we truly need is God's help. And that's why the fourth card represents us understanding the power of God's Holy Spirit that we're not just doing this on our own strength, that you're not just gonna figure out, okay, what do I need to change? And, and, and you should do that. You should, after this session is over, spend some time thinking or discussing with some friends or those around you, and even maybe writing down on paper what it is you want to declare war on. You can't win a battle that you won't identify your enemy in, so you need to write that down. You need to think about it, but we're not just gonna end there. We must ultimately rely on God's power in us to give us strength, to tell us who we are, and to really supply and supercharge our efforts to do all that we've been called to do. And we don't want to just rely on our own strength. We want power from above. And he's the one who's going to help us not be victims, blaming other people for our dysfunction. It's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault. He's going to help us rise up as victors. And you can't be a victim and a victor at the same time.